The short story Dr. Heidegger's Experiment by the American writer Nathaniel Hawthorne was first published anonymously in 1837 in the Knickerbocker magazine. It was republished later the same year under his own name in the short story collection Twice Told Tales. It tells the story of the elderly and mysterious Dr. Heidegger, who invites four people of his acquaintance into his somewhat sinister study to participate in an experiment which involves the drinking of water from the legendary Fountain of Youth that he claims his friend has brought back from Lake Macaco in Florida. His four subjects seem to be ideal candidates in that they are all old, miserable and down on their luck as a result of their poor behaviour when young. We're also told that the three gentlemen, once upon a time, almost killed one another as they fought over the attentions of the one lady of the group, the widow Witcherly. It would therefore seem to be a no-brainer that they would welcome the opportunity for a do-over of their lives, to apply the wisdom they have gained over the years so that they don't make the same mistakes again. Convinced that a demonstration of the water's magical properties on a withered rose is nothing more than a parlour trick, the four, nevertheless, agree to participate in the experiment. On drinking the mysterious sparkling water, the four do indeed appear to become younger, but rather than apply the wisdom they have painfully acquired as they have aged, they just start acting in the same selfish manner that they did all those years ago, dancing around and flirting, singing drinking songs, rambling on about politics and harebrained business schemes and heartlessly mocking this still aged Dr Heidegger. The men even go so far as to fight once more over the widow Witcherly, who has regained the beauty and vanity of her youth. In the ensuing scuffle, the vase gets knocked over and smashed, causing the loss of the water. Unfortunately, the anti-aging effect appears to have been only temporary, and the four, along with Dr Heidegger's rose, return to their withered states in the blink of an eye, with no water left to make them go back to how they were. Rather than be humbled by their ridiculous behaviour, however, they appear to have learnt absolutely nothing, and the story ends with their resolution to make the journey to Florida to devote the rest of their lives to drinking at the Fountain of Youth. Hawthorne utilises a first-person, unreliable narrator to tell his story. In other words, the first-person narration is focused through the eyes of an, in this case, anonymous and non-participatory character, who we cannot be sure is telling the complete truth. Not only because he clearly has not witnessed what went on for himself, but also because he actually tells us that he's not to be trusted. The way the narrator deliberately undermines his own credibility very explicitly places ambiguity and the theme of appearance versus reality at the very heart of this story where exploiting the tropes found in ghost stories, such as a magical elixir, the existence of which has its foundations in myth and legend, an enchanted mirror, a haunted portrait, a mysterious death, books relating to the occult, and an entire room that allegedly comes to life, Hawthorne makes sure that nothing is quite what it seems not even the enigmatic Dr Heidegger himself. And more questions are raised than are answered. E.g., is the water really an elixir, or is it just alcohol? If the water isn't magical, how do we explain the rose and the butterfly? What's the deal with the supposedly enchanted mirror? And what were the actual circumstances surrounding the mysterious death of Dr Heidegger's fiancée? Perhaps the most pertinent question we should be asking ourselves, however, is do any of these questions ultimately matter when we consider what the true nature of the experiment may actually be? Is it their becoming young or their belief that they've become young that is more important? 
We could argue that what Dr Heidegger actually sets out to prove is not the alleged anti-aging effects of a supposed elixir, but rather what he somewhat pessimistically believes to be an essential truth about human nature, that age does not automatically confer wisdom and that we as a species seem incapable of learning from our own mistakes. Even when given the opportunity, or the belief that we've been given the opportunity, to relive life in a better way, the behaviour of the four suggests that humanity's moral weaknesses are deeply ingrained and that redemption is beyond us. We could also, however, argue that Dr Heidegger is deliberately playing with loaded dice and that he has selected a group of people who are not a cross-section of the whole of society, but rather a group of people who are the very embodiment of the seven deadly sins, i.e. lust, vanity, pride, gluttony, anger and greed. How likely was it ever going to be that a leopard was going to change its spots and that they would mend their ways? Hawthorne begins his story by introducing the four venerable friends invited by the very singular old Dr Heidegger to his study. Note that the adjective venerable means admired, respected and wise, while the adjective singular in this context means unique, peculiar and weird. And we will consider what the narrator means to imply with these particular epithets when we have more information about the characters to whom they are applied. Dr Heidegger's four guests are collectively described as being melancholy old creatures who had been unfortunate in life and whose greatest misfortune it was that they were not long ago in their grades. In other words, it is the narrator's opinion that they are all so miserable, pathetic and down on their luck that they would be far better off dead. In particular, Mr Medbourne is described as having been a prosperous merchant but who had lost his all by a frantic speculation and was now little better than a mendicant. In other words, back in the day, he'd been a wealthy and successful businessman, but presumably still dissatisfied with the riches he had acquired, had lost all his money in a wild and foolish investment, with the result that he is now little more than a beggar. Colonel Killigrew, best described as a debauchee, is no better having wasted his best years and his health and his substance in the pursuit of sinful pleasures. We don't find out what these sinful pleasures were exactly, but we suspect that too much alcohol, rich food, sex and gambling are to blame, as we're told that he suffers from a brood of pains such as the gout and diverse, or various, other torments of soul and body. Mr Gascoigne, on the other hand, is a ruined politician, a man of evil fame, or at least had been so, till time had buried him from the knowledge of the present generation and made him obscure instead of infamous. The implication here is that he was discovered to be power-hungry and corrupt and that this brought about his downfall as a politician. What's probably the hardest thing for his pride to bear, however, is that he is now a total has-been. The only female of the group, the widow Witcherly, is described as having been a great beauty in her day, but for a long while past she had lived in deep seclusion on account of certain scandalous stories which had prejudiced the gentry of the town against her. It seems that the widow Witcherly's vanity when she was young led her into entertaining the advances of a number of men the scandal of which has turned her into a pariah, as the well-to-do people of the town have turned their backs on her. Not only this, but the four of them also have a somewhat chequered, shared past. It is a circumstance worth mentioning that each of these three old gentlemen were early lovers of the widow Witcherly, and had once been on the point of cutting each other's throats for her sake. Note that this foreshadows the conflict that will arise later as the four fall back into old patterns of behaviour. What we can conclude from all of this is that their moral weaknesses have led them to squander their youth. 
The epithet venerable now seems somewhat misplaced, as they are a rather motley crew, neither being worthy of admiration or respect, nor seeming particularly wise. This should immediately set alarm bells ringing that the narrator is not shooting from the hip, and that we should be wary of what he goes on to tell us. Hawthorne also adds another layer of doubt, as he insinuates that all five characters are not necessarily of sound mind. Dr Heidegger and all his four guests were sometimes thought to be a little beside themselves, which suggests that we should again perhaps take what is to unfold with more than a pinch of salt. Hawthorne now proceeds to exploit the tropes found in ghost stories, to paint a detailed picture of the study in which the experiment is to take place. This not only creates an atmosphere of mystery and suspense, but also reveals the extent to which the narrator wants the reader to consider Dr Heidegger a singular or peculiar character. Note how he prefaces this description with a disclaimer, however. If all the stories were true, Dr Heidegger's study must have been a very curious place which once again adds to the reader's doubt as to the veracity of what we are being told, as the narrator makes it clear that he doesn't have first-hand experience of anything that he is relating to us. It's a dim, old-fashioned chamber festooned with cobwebs and besprinkled with antique dust that contains a mishmash of scientific and supernatural paraphernalia. It's furnished with bookcases containing antique volumes of varying sizes, a bronze bust of Hippocrates, commonly considered the father of modern medicine, a tall and narrow oaken closet with its door ajar within which doubtfully appeared a skeleton, and on the wall a looking-glass, presenting its high and dusty plate within a tarnished gilt frame, which it is fabled his deceased patients inhabit while on the other side of the room there is a full-length portrait of a young lady, arrayed in the faded magnificence of silk, satin and brocade, and with a visage or face as faded as her dress. We learn that this is a painting of Dr Heidegger's fiancée, who mysteriously died on the eve of their wedding, after having swallowed one of her lover's prescriptions, leading us to question, was it an accident? Or was it murder? The narrator leaves the greatest curiosity of the study to last. A ponderous folio volume bound in black leather with massive silver clasps that is well known to be a book of magic, and which when disturbed, it is alleged, caused a number of the objects in the study to momentarily come to life. In contrast to its gloomy and eerie surroundings, the cut glass vase stands out on the black wooden table in the middle of the room, as it is of beautiful form and elaborate workmanship, with the sun shining between the faded curtains, causing a mild splendour to be reflected from it, onto the ashen visages of the five old people who sat around. Next to it are four champagne glasses, signalling that the experiment will involve something to be drunk. It is at this point that the narrator once more feels it necessary to remind us not only that Dr Heidegger was a very strange old gentleman, but also that it is this very quirkiness of character that has been at the centre of a thousand fantastic stories that have been made up about him, some of which, to my shame be it spoken, might possibly be traced back to mine own voracious self. And if any passages of the present tale should startle the reader's faith, I must be content to bear the stigma of a fiction monger. In other words, he is saying that he is already guilty of having made up loads of crazy tales about the man, so if the reader finds anything that he is about to say implausible, then he supposes he'll just have to live with it. Heidegger begins by demonstrating what he purports to be the water's magical properties on a withered rose which was given to him by his fiancée, Sylvia Ward, on the eve of their wedding just before she died, and that has been kept ever since pressed between the pages of the black leather-bound book, which common report affirmed to be a book of magic. 
the rose soon springs back to life, assuming a deepening tinge of crimson, as if the flower were reviving from a death-like slumber. His guests, however, are not impressed, dismissing it as a very pretty deception and demanding to know how it was done. Heidegger instead asks them what they know of the Fountain of Youth, which Ponce de Leon, the Spanish adventurer, went in search of two or three centuries ago, and tells them that where the explorer failed because he was looking in the wrong place, his anonymous acquaintance succeeded, and what he brought back is now in the vase. Note how Dr Heidegger, when he invites the four to drink as much of it as they like, adds that he will not be having any himself, with the excuse that, having had much trouble in growing old, I am in no hurry to grow young again. How sincere do we believe he is being here? It could be argued that growing old has taught him wisdom, and with wisdom comes acceptance of our human frailties, making the youth-giving properties of the water of no interest to him. Don't forget, of course, that he would not be able to do anything about the biggest regret of his life, the death of Sylvia. So it would be pointless on that score anyway. It could also be argued, however, that if this is an elaborate ruse concocted by Dr Heidegger to confirm his pessimistic view of human nature and to give him pleasure and a sense of superiority from watching these people he actually dislikes making complete fools of themselves, then he will far better achieve this from a distance. Note how just before the four take their first glass, Dr Heidegger gives them a final word of advice, that they should draw up a few general rules for your guidance. Think what a sin and a shame it would be if, with your particular advantages, you should not become patterns of virtue and wisdom to all the young people of the age. The way they made him no answer except by a feeble and tremulous laugh, as though it should go without saying that they would behave impeccably, and how he accepts this merely by ambiguously responding, I rejoice that I have so well selected the subjects of my experiment, makes us wonder who he is actually complimenting here. Note how Hawthorne also makes the description of the water itself ambiguous. It's seemingly sharing qualities with a drink such as champagne. It was apparently impregnated with an effervescent gas, for little bubbles were continually ascending from the depths of the glasses and bursting in silvery spray at the surface. As the liquor diffused a pleasant perfume, the old people doubted not that it possessed cordial and comfortable properties. And... After they drink the first glass, there is indeed an almost immediate improvement in the aspect of the party, not unlike what might have been produced by a glass of generous wine. Well, after two, they start behaving in such a manner as prove that the water of the fountain of youth possessed some intoxicating qualities. Does the water have magical powers, or are they just plain drunk? As the four continue to drink the water, they do indeed appear to have become physically younger. Their eyes grew clear and bright. A dark shade deepened among their silvery locks. They sat around the table, three gentlemen of middle age and a woman hardly beyond her buxom prime. Unfortunately, the moral weaknesses that defined their earlier years seem to come hand in hand with their youthful appearance, and they soon revert to type as Mr Gascoigne now rattled forth full-throated sentences about patriotism, national glory and the people's right. Now muttered some perilous stuff or other in a sly and doubtful whisper. While Colonel Killigrew all this time had been trolling forth a jolly bottle song and ringing his glass in symphony with the chorus, while his eyes wandered toward the buxom figure of the widow Witchley and Mr Medbourne was involved in a calculation of dollars and cents, with which was strangely intermingled a project for supplying the East Indies with ice by harnessing a team of whales to the polar icebergs. The widow Witchley has done no better in reigning in the vanity of her youth, as she meanwhile stood before the mirror, curtsying and simpering to her own image, and greeting it as the friend whom she loved better than all the world beside. 
Hawthorne once more draws our attention to the water, the delicate spray of which, as it effervesced from the surface, resembled the tremulous glitter of diamonds. And even though the chamber had grown duskier than ever due to the setting of the sun, a mild and moonlike splendour gleamed from within the vase. Note how Hawthorne's language here suggests that the water is precious and seems to emanate or give off its own source of light, even while the natural light is diminishing, the dying of the day perhaps highlighting the relentless passage of time. Meanwhile, Heidegger keeps himself apart, sitting in a high-backed, elaborately carved oaken armchair and bearing an uncanny resemblance to Father Time himself. As the group gets younger still, it appears that the most singular effect of their gaiety was an impulse to mock the infirmity and decrepitude of which they had so lately been the victims. Not only do they laugh at their own old-fashioned clothes that now look out of place on their young frames, but the men also make fun of Dr Heidegger himself. How he walks, how he refers to his book of magic, and even how he sits. The widow Witcherly goes so far as to invite him to dance, a request he refuses with dignity. Pray excuse me, answered the doctor quietly. I am old and rheumatic and my dancing days were over long ago. But either of these gay young gentlemen will be glad of so pretty a partner. What are Dr Heidegger's motives here? On the surface, it, it comes across as though he is merely being gallant. But should we suspect that he is setting the four up to resume the almost deadly rivalry of decades earlier? As the three men gather around the widow Witcherly to claim her as a dance partner, we are told that never was there a livelier picture of youthful rivalship, with bewitching beauty for the prize. Yet, by a strange deception, owing to the duskiness of the chamber and the antique dresses which they still wore, the tall mirror is said to have reflected the figures of three old, grey, withered grandsires, ridiculously contending for the skinny ugliness of a shriveled grandam. Again, we are confronted with ambiguity. The narrator suggests that it is merely a trick of the light that causes the mirror to show them as old men and women behaving as though they are young. But does this actually lend weight to our hypothesis that the four are merely drunk, and that the whole thing is an elaborate trick on the part of Dr Heidegger? Or is there yet another interpretation if we allow that the mirror is enchanted? Perhaps it has the power to show what they are like on the inside rather than on the outside. As the three men jockey for position around the widow Witcherly, who plays them all off against each other, what starts off as good-natured banter quickly turns sour, as inflamed to madness by the coquetry of the girl widow, who neither granted nor quite withheld her favours, the three rivals began to interchange threatening glances. Still keeping hold of their fair prize, they grappled fiercely at one another's throats, with the result that the vase is dashed into a thousand fragments and the water lost. The party is over as sudden as it began, as the four, as well as Dr Heidegger's rose, return to their former wizened states. While Dr Heidegger is stoical about what has happened, I love it as well thus, as in its dewy freshness, observed he, pressing the withered rose to his withered lips. The other four are far less philosophical. The widow Witcherly is inconsolable, even going so far as to wish she be dead. With a shuddering impulse that showed her a woman still, the widow clasped her skinny hands before her face and wished that the coffin lid were over it, since it could be no longer beautiful. The story ends with Dr Heidegger informing them that he is happy the water has been spilt on the ground, as what he has witnessed has taught him a valuable lesson. Well, I bemoan it not, for if the fountain gushed at my very doorstep, I would not stoop to bathe my lips in it. No, though its delirium were for years instead of moments. The four, however, have learnt no such lesson themselves, and the last we hear of them is that they have resolved to go to Florida, to quaff at morning, noon and night from the fountain of youth. 
we are left with a number of unanswerable questions. Was Dr Heidegger a bona fide scientist with a more than passing interest in the supernatural, who had an altruistic desire to help his friends, even though it didn't quite work out? Or were his motives altogether more selfish in that he wished to be at peace with his own old age and the pain he had suffered from his own youthful mistakes? Or is he just a con artist and sadist who took pleasure from exploiting four very obviously foolish people into making an extremely unedifying spectacle of themselves? Alternatively, perhaps the narrator just made the whole thing up. We'll never know, but ultimately it doesn't matter, as its very ambiguity demonstrates that human beings are very complex creatures and in life there are no easy answers. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.